Good morning. You know, it's nice to see you're still gainfully employed. We update every single day, millions of servers, and yet we still created some new business opportunities for you. So that's good to see. Uh, so it is, it is incredibly wonderful to be here at ESPC. Uh, the team and I love this event. Uh, it's great to see much, so much passion and people from all over Europe, in fact, all over the world to come to this amazing event. The team here, Kevin, Sarah, and the broader ESPC team is always so warm and welcoming. And so we were thrilled that after three long years that they made it through their own business challenges and are hosting once again a fabulous, fabulous event. It's incredibly valuable. The pace of change in business, work, and technology is faster than ever. And so we need events like this to come together and share best practices and roadmaps. Uh, the team was telling me over 130 sessions uh, covering everything from the latest in Viva to core tailoring and customization of SharePoints. I saw Sue Hanley had a session here. What would be an event without Sue talking about SharePoint? And so, <laughs> Uh, so it is just really wonderful to be here, and thank you all for being part of the best community in technology. I believe firmly that if you want to build great collaboration tools, it starts with a team and broader community that's focused on collaboration, helping each other out, supporting new members of the community, and it's just great to see uh, that thrive and continue here this week. And I was really excited to announce back at our Ignite conference a few weeks ago the evolution of the community that continues to support big, major marquee events like this one that can afford to scale to 100 plus sessions, but also local community events around the world. These were started as SharePoint and Microsoft 365 Saturdays and a number of other different types of events. And so we launched a new site uh, called communitydays.org a few months ago, where you can discover these events near you and create your own. Uh, you can talk to a lot of the presenters here who went on their own career journeys of, as Martin did, discovering SharePoint, becoming an expert in it, and finding the passion of sharing their knowledge with others. So thank you again for being part of the best community in technology. We've got a lot to cover today. It's, you know, I feel like when I look at this script that I write for each of these, there's always, this is the busiest year yet. And I double check that that's true. And it really is. The number of things we added to our products that had been around for quite a while, be it, be it SharePoint or Office, or new products like Syntex and Viva and those lines, this is the biggest year for innovation we've done. And it's about really two things, helping individuals be more productive, collaborate with others, working any place, anytime, anywhere, on any device in a very secure and seamless way, but also helping the larger organizations that they are part of transform with the latest collaboration tools that connect inside and outside their organization. AI and machine learning technologies that help automate work so people don't have to do it all. And of course, uh, the Power Platform suite of technologies to help people automate these repeatable business processes and build applications around their existing systems as well as Microsoft 365. But as the economy sort of went from its uh, cycle up during the pandemic to uh, a set of challenges, of course, CFOs of these organizations want to make sure there's a very clear near-term economic return. Uh, so we did some analysis and we believe that you can, in addition to all the collaboration and security and transformation benefits you get in Microsoft 365, you can save over 60% doing more with less versus a disaggregated set of collaboration tools that you'd have to license and integrate and manage in a distributed way and so forth. And so we think there is a strong proposition for Microsoft 365, both in the hard dollar cost savings that we can provide to you as well as the very substantial pace of innovation. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so let's first start with Microsoft Teams. We have a unique point of view with Microsoft Teams that we launched about six years ago. 
which is bring all these modes of collaboration into a single seamless experience and let it run on any device, including in room systems, and, and we've announced with the Mesh for Teams uh, work that we'll be bringing it to VR headsets and so forth, but all your calls, chats, channels, meetings, files, et cetera, in a single experience, but then of, of course it can be a platform for partners, and you see a set of wonderful partners supporting uh, Teams and SharePoint and more at this event, and custom solutions, be they built with JavaScript or the Power Platform to tailor Teams for your particular business processes. Uh, and so that flexible, unique approach we have with Teams, we think was really key to helping organizations cope with the shift to remote work during the pandemic. And we're very, very grateful that over 270 million people are now using Teams every month. And this continues to grow. Uh, and we're investing significantly, and you'll see this in the sessions uh, throughout this event, in Teams. In fact, this year, over 450 new capabilities to Microsoft Teams. Uh, Kathy is going to cover a few of them. Everything from fundamentals and performance to new innovations, embracing things like the metaverse and um, machine learning to break through with new collaboration approaches in Teams. And of course, uh, we have SharePoint. The S in ESPC is SharePoint, and SharePoint underpins Teams in so much more. Just like Teams being, if you will, a mini suite that brings together a comprehensive set of tools, SharePoint is the most flexible content collaboration platform in the industry, bringing together files and sites and videos and apps and more in a single platform. And we're investing in both the native primary experiences of SharePoint, but also SharePoint powering the rest of Microsoft 365. In fact, let's start with the base part of SharePoint. Uh, Kathy will share some of the things we've added to the SharePoint user experience and more are coming. We looked and the communication site, the simple new engaging publishing capability of SharePoint has grown in 2022 by over 40% in its usage, which is pretty amazing to me to see a product that it's in its 21st year continuing to have its core capability grow and find new users. We're really excited about that, and there's much more to come. Of course, SharePoint powers OneDrive and Office collaboration and Microsoft Lists. Stream we'll talk about. Our new is family members uh, extensions, Viva and Syntax, we'll talk about those. SharePoint's really unique in providing the flexible content management platform and experiences behind the widest range of scenarios. And so we're very excited that with all those ex applications built on SharePoint as opposed to Share as in addition to SharePoint proper, that new data put into SharePoint each month has grown to over 150 petabytes. That is 40 times the monthly growth rate SharePoint saw six, seven years ago when we did the Future of SharePoint event. And that growth rate continues to grow, which is mind boggling to me. Uh, and so we've got a great set of investments coming for Teams and SharePoint that we're going to go through this morning. And the basic framework we're going to have in the keynote is we're going to first talk about the core collaboration uh, capabilities in Teams, OneDrive, and SharePoint. Kathy Dew is going to talk about that. Then Adam Harmitz is going to talk about some of the newer applications that build inside Teams and SharePoint, Stream, Lists, and Loop, to be specific. Uh, and then Chris McNulty is going to talk about these two new families we've introduced in the last couple of years, Viva, our employee experiences platform, and Syntex, a value-added set of content services embracing technologies across Microsoft. And then I'll wrap up with a bit on uh, some of our newest capabilities for IT pros and developers. So with that, let's get right into it, and I am very excited to bring up Kathy Dew to share some of the latest on Teams, OneDrive, and SharePoint. Kathy. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jeff. I'm really excited to be here today to talk with you all about some great collaboration and innovation that's been happening across Teams, OneDrive, and SharePoint. So we're going to jump right on in. So we're going to talk about some of those great foundational innovations within Microsoft Teams. With these, we know that performance is a key thing. And trust me, 
we hear you. Performance needs to be improved here. So over the past year, we have shipped a number of improvements to both the framework and the performance to improve the switching between channels and chat by over 30%. It's getting better every day. More and more innovations, more and more investments from the team to make performance a key priority in teams. And I want to talk just about one of the different features that you see up here, because we're going to delve into a few more of them with some demos to get a little bit more about what some of these announcements were at Ignite. But one of my favorites that's on this that we don't demo is the schedule to send. This feature really is great, especially in today's world, where we more and more work with a geo-dispersed group of people. Now I can schedule to send that chat when my teammate is working, during their office hours, allowing them to optimize their responses and not have to get there and see that list of five different chats they missed while they were asleep. So schedule to send is a great feature to have. And that's just one of those innovations that we talked about at night. But let's talk a little bit about Microsoft Teams Premium. This really allows you to take any meeting, regardless of its type or size, and make it more secure, personalized, and intelligent. But what does that mean? We'll talk about some different components of that, the first being meeting guides. Meeting guides are really your templates for meetings. They are easy to configure best practices for your policies and setup. And you go through and configure these, and it allows people to create new meetings from those templates, those guides, allowing you to not have to worry about all of those different components, who gets to join automatically, who has to wait in a wait room, and focus on the conversations that are needed. Just get right into the meeting without all of that unnecessary setup. A really great feature. The next one, advanced webinars. This is how you superpower your webinars, really taking them to the next level. Jumping in and improving experiences like registration, where you can have automatic wait lists, being able to um, improve and approve people to join the meeting from that wait list, to set up different experiences with email reminders that you can then socialize organizers with the attendees in a green room and be able to monitor the Q&A and chat in that green room. And you also get to configure and customize what your attendees see. So really customizing the webinar experience even further. Next, do you ever have that day where you just don't want to turn your camera on? I know I do. Mesh avatars are the perfect solution to this. Now you can create this uh, <laughs> advanced animated version of yourself. You can even create up to three versions of yourself, different avatars wearing different outfits, different accessories, different features, and you can then have them follow with your audio. They follow your voice so it looks like you're speaking. They can have different reactions. One of my favorite things that my team does sometimes, we get a little silly, you can even have avatar dance parties. It's really fun with the reactions. So they are the great solution for those days when you want to be engaged in the meeting, but you don't want to turn your cameras on. Then let's talk about Microsoft Places. This is a brand new product being introduced that is really about connected workplaces, being able to coordinate this hybrid world that we find ourselves in, where some people go into the office, some people work from home, and how do I enhance that experience? Being able to understand where my colleagues are working and what their work style is, and really being able to maximize that effectiveness for those experiences. So hybrid scheduling is one way that we have with Microsoft Places. This gets data from Outlook and Teams and allows you to look at the week ahead to understand where 
the most in-office attendance might be if you're looking to schedule a meeting so that you can look at the conference rooms and really pull together more people that are going to be in person to really enhance that. It also gives people a great way to see more information about your conference rooms and enhanced experiences around that. So it's a great solution to some of this hybrid uh, workforce experiences that we have. Switching directions, let's talk a little bit about files and OneDrive. This is really that unified collaborative file experience across M365. It's the same file experience everywhere. All of your files in OneDrive, this powers things like co-authoring, at mentions, all with the same guarantees as M365 for security, compliance, and governance. When we look at things like OneDrive, one of the great features for this is known folder move. This allows you to keep your important documents, pictures, and desktop backed up in sync to OneDrive with very little configuration. And we're excited that this is now available for Mac OS. Now, sharing. Talk a few things about a new sharing page that we're introducing in OneDrive. So in this, sharing is always one of those things where you're looking for a file, you know someone sent it to you, you may know who sent it to you, or you may know what type of file it was, and you have to go try to find it in your email or in Teams chat. Now coming to the, share, the shared page, I can come in and do this and look and share it with you and coordinate that. But we've taken it further by introducing additional views that are more human-centric for how people search. So I know that Megan sent me a file. So I can now filter down to Megan. I get a card. I don't see it in those quick ones. I can expand out to a full experience of all of those different files that Megan shared with me. And then I can even filter from that. I know it was a Word document. So I can filter down to just the Word documents that Megan shared with me to find the file that I was looking for. And then finding documents that are associated with meetings, right? So we've introduced a meetings view where those grouped documents are associated underneath those meetings so that you can easily find the documents associated with your meetings, really taking shared files and those experiences further and making it easier than ever for you to find them. Now, I want to talk a little bit further about how you share files with other people and some of the enhancements that have happened there. This is a common experience and a common menu across all of your M365 apps. So once you launch up shared, we get this common menu with a dropdown that has app-specific features, and then I can come in here and I can see right in the sharing menu who has access to the file, and then I can say I want to share it to specific people. Once I move past that, you'll see here, once I start sharing that file, I've now got an enhanced piece where I can use a can review. So now I've got an additional piece where I can send something for review. And with that for review, once they go in and open that file and start editing it, the great thing is if they can edit and comment, they can't delete in the file, right? Huge. It's a game changer. Such a common scenario that makes it so much better. So then we kind of look past that. How many of you have lots of documents in document libraries? So I wanted to give you a little sneak peek about how OneDrive and document libraries are going to get superpowers from Project Nucleus. Oh, let me go back. Is it playing? This one's a little delayed. Hopefully it's playing. It's not playing, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> But anyhow, I'll give you the summary of what happens here. In this, 
you can now come in and with Project Nucleus, this allows in OneDrive or in your document library, see now they've got it working for me, that you can go in and designate a file to be available offline. So now even in my document libraries, I can do this and designate it to sync offline and make it available so that I can open it in Word, make edits, make all of those comments, those changes that I need, update the metadata, and then once I'm reconnected back to the internet, of course, it syncs back just like normal. So all the great features that we love about OneDrive and being able to have that sync is now coming to document libraries without the huge restrictions of views with Project Nucleus. Faster than ever, more available for you. Sounds great, right? Something we're all going to love. Let's talk about a few additional OneDrive announcements. OneDrive is investing a lot more in our files experiences, making it easy for you to get those files, no matter the app, in one single place. With this, there's a lot of opportunity. They're definitely working to make access of your files easier. A couple of things that I'll highlight that you'll start to see and hear more and more about a new home page for OneDrive will be coming, something great to see happening where you'll get to have more and more file access from there. And then the OneDrive app in Teams, another great place to see those same experiences within Teams. Right? So we'll move on to something near and dear to my heart as well, some SharePoint investments. So over the past year, we have done a lot of work. We've introduced a lot of different features, a lot of different opportunities. I'm going to highlight one, my favorite feature, may have been one I worked on, connected templates. <laughs> connected templates are a great solution because they actually unify SharePoint and Teams more than ever. Now, because each team that you create does get a SharePoint site, we have scenario-based Teams templates and scenario-based SharePoint site templates that are tied together. So if you go to Teams and you create a project management team from that template, the SharePoint site that's created in the back end automatically gets the project management site template applied to it, and those great lists and pages automatically get added as tabs into Teams. So truly bringing those experiences closer together and making it faster and easier to start collaborating together. And as you can see, we're nowhere near done. We have a large number of investments coming in 2023. So just be watching because there's more to come for SharePoint. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, we're very excited. Hopefully you can see that we're investing across the spectrum. Still very focused on simplicity and performance in OneDrive, SharePoint, and Teams, but also embracing new ways of expressing yourself and creating SharePoint sites, new ways to collaborate with things like Mesh and, and more and more. Uh, so big set of focuses for us in that area. Next, we're going to talk about some of the newer applications. There continue to be things that are built on innovations in SharePoint and integrated in the collaboration framework of Teams, but you can also use them on a standalone basis. And they're stream for video, our new Microsoft Lists offering that we've made available standalone, as well as inside SharePoint and Teams, and the new Microsoft Loop, which we think is a very unique approach uh, in breaking through and collaboration. So to show those three new applications uh, and a lot more, I'm very excited to bring back to ESBC Adam Harmitz. Adam. Thanks, Jeff. Hello, everybody. It's a privilege to be here today. Hi, Heather. Hi, Jason. Thanks for front rowing it. <laughs> All right. So I only have 10 minutes to cover three entire products. So I'm just going to get going with the first one we're going to talk about today which is Microsoft Stream. So think about Microsoft Stream as a gateway for enabling video within your organization. And the big news for Microsoft Stream this year is that the new stream is GA. And it's been GA for a couple months. So we already have millions of users on it. And sometimes we call the new stream the stream on SharePoint. So it's video and stream built on top of SharePoint. 
And that's important for two reasons. It's important for IT, because it means video files have the same governance and compliance and retention as any other type of file. And it's important for us as end users, because then you work with videos, and you can store them right alongside your SharePoint, inside your SharePoint document libraries and your OneDrive files, and it has consistent you know, copy and move and sharing UX, and including external sharing. And we've managed to do that without compromising the core video experience at all. So let me go and show you that right here. Here is the stream start page. It's just like the Word start page or the Excel start page. Because yes, stream files are now stored alongside a bunch of other videos, but sometimes if you know you're looking for a video, the stream start page is an excellent place to start. You can look at your favorites, including Teams meeting recordings, recently opened, search for things. And basically, it's just great for discovery and wayfinding of video in particular. Switching over to the player page of a video, I'm going to just show you all the core capabilities of video that have really been nailed by stream. So you can update the title and description. You can go grab or change the thumbnail of a video super easily from the player page. Copy and move, those are some consistent things, that, you know, same as any other type of file. And share is consistent too, of course, video specific things like grabbing an, event, uh, an embed code is right there too. The player controls like you'd expect, you can turn on subtitles, uh, you can in, you know, increase the speed of the video, suppress noise. And now let's go ahead and look at transcripts. Transcripts are incredibly important for video because they make videos more searchable, more discoverable, more accessible. Stream can automatically generate transcripts in 28 different languages now, and the UX you're seeing here makes it really easy to go in and fix a couple typos or errors or search through the video transcript itself. And speaking of making videos more accessible, in a second we're going to go ahead and click on the chapters feature. So a lot of enterprise videos are really, really long, and the important parts are scattered throughout the entire video. It is incredibly simple to just create chapters to allow people to hone in on particular parts of the video. And one more thing to show just in the core experience of working with videos is, as I said, that videos are stored alongside any other type of file. They're just like a Word document. And because of that, he, they have some similar commenting as well. You can at mention, you can like, and you can comment on a video just as easy as you can comment on a Word doc. Now, why am I showing you all these basic features? It's basically just to show video is ready for prime time. It's built on top of SharePoint. But of course, the real magic of Stream is that it's integrated in the rest of Microsoft 365. I could have chosen a dozen different ways of showing that. I'll show you just one right here, which is if I copy paste a video into Viva Engage, it automatically upsizes to the, uh, to the Stream player. I can get my transcript. I can get my chapters. I can see all the advanced part of a Stream video right there in Engage. And you know, Stream gener or Yammer generates a, um, an announcement for this video post too, and that same player is available right in Outlook as well. So that is a brief overview of Stream. We talked about how it's built on SharePoint. We talked about how all the core capabilities are there, and we talked about uh, how it's embedded in Microsoft 365. Rather than reading this eye chart to you, just rest assured that the team is on fire delivering a ton of functionality. And really, what I'd like you to do here is, you know, rather than looking at all of this, think about how you want to use video in 2023. Great time for New Year's resolution. If you see Jeff, ask him about his Fast Friday video feature. Every Friday, he has a five-minute video that clarifies how he spent his time and what the strategy is. Most new hires on my team create a two-minute video that introduce themselves. These are just great ways you can start embracing video in your organization thanks to Microsoft Stream. Moving ahead, Microsoft Lists. It's going to be really hard for me not to call it SharePoint Lists because I've been working on this 17 years. Uh, and the point is all the goodness of, of SharePoint integrated in the list is still there, but we've broken it out into its own products, such that it can be available in the consumer as well as integrated in Teams, et cetera, et cetera. And in my 17 years, one of my favorite things to do is to ask customers, hey, what are your cool use cases for Microsoft Lists? What do you use Lists for? I've heard everything from storing dog food recipes, like little canine dog food recipes, not tech dog food, uh, train schedules, uh, you know, conference uh, agendas, t-shirt sizes for concerts. And this is what we mean by flexible, because Microsoft Lists can scale all the way from the really high end, mission critical, deep business process, all the way to the personal use cases. So how many people here have used the list in the past couple months? Nice. Really good show of hands. 
This demo is for you. This is for the, the creators, the button clickers, the people who are actually using the software on a daily basis. The team, just like Stream, is really on fire, adding dozens of new UX enhancements every month. You can see here beautifully color-coded uh, choice columns, number columns that can be barcodes, uh, icons to determine column choice types. And this next demo is something that has been requested for an awfully long time. In fact, Christian, I don't know if you're here, somebody replied to a tweet just last night asking for this feature. We didn't code it up just last night. Thankfully, I already had it in the, in the can. But the, the feature has to do with, you see there's the interview date, start, and end time. So when your list data has to work with date ranges, you want a different display of how you're working with this data. And so I'm going to go create a calendar view for this data. I'm going to go ahead and configure it, set the start time, the end time. And you're going to see it's going to look just like an Outlook calendar, except that it is backed by list data. This is something that's been requested for an awfully long time. Go ahead. Please, please applaud. <laughs> to be blunt with you, I offered to buy drinks if I couldn't get applaud for this particular demo. So thank you for ever started it. But I don't know if you noticed, you could drag it. Not, not only do we have a calendar view, one of the times, one of the reasons we waited a little bit to deliver this feature is we really wanted to nail it. You can drag and drop different uh, calendar appointments across the calendar and it updates the underlying list. You might have seen it, even if stuff doesn't, isn't scheduled yet, you can drag it onto the calendar. This is just what we're committed to, whether it's this or Kanban boards or whatever the view is, of really um, making sure that the data really pops and the UX is appropriate to whatever you need for your flexible list scenarios. Just like with Stream, the next demo I wanted to show you integrates lists with the rest of Microsoft 365. So I'll go ahead and play the video. I'm just going to create a travel approval request list using, by the way, some of our beautiful templates. And if I use this template, I'm going to ask somebody named Steven in just a couple seconds to approve my travel request. The cool thing about this demo is that Steven never needs to visit the list because this approval is injected into the centralized, personalized approval app in Teams. So I'll give it a second just to go do that. So I've requested Steven to do that. And now I'm in the approval. Steven is in the approvals app. And he's just going to approve it right there. And of course, it's going to update the underlying list. And the reason this is important, you hear Microsoft, oftentimes we talk about moving from app and tool-centric experiences to personal-centric experiences, putting the person at the center. I don't know another demo that demonstrates this better than this, than this sort of quick 20-second demo. Any app in Teams can register all the approvals they need to do, as well as any list automatically does that. And Steven doesn't need to worry about what tool to use. He has one place to go that is personalized for all the approvals he needs to see within his organization. This is what it means when we say Teams puts the person at the center and we build at Microsoft people-centered experiences in this era of computing. So one more thing I want to talk about is Jeff mentioned it already, but Microsoft List is available in, outside of your work life as well. So if you have scenarios such as, I don't know, you want to have all the uh, Christmas, Christmas Village um, uh, things in Copenhagen combined into one list, or if you run a soccer or a football club, uh, and you want to be able to use lists, <laughs> and you want to be able to use lists in those scenarios as well, go to lists.live.com. So you can use the same full functionality of lists in your personal life as well. We will share this roadmap. You can see what's coming soon. The team is on fire, delivering new user experience, new uh, compliance and controls every single month. Lastly, I want to talk about one of the, the newest uh, applications in Microsoft 365, Microsoft Loop. And to get what we're trying to do with Microsoft Loop, I want, I want you to envision the last time you started a new project or you joined a new team. Think about the mental headspace you and your colleagues were in at that time. It was a time for collaboration, a time for brainstorming, a time for a lot of tacit information in people's head that needed to get down on paper. It was time for brainstorming and note-taking, except with, with Microsoft Loop, you do it in an insanely collaborative way. And the best way to do that is just to show you. So here I am in Microsoft Teams, and I'm going to add a new Loop component. The scenario here is we're replying to an RFP, and there's a bunch of to-dos that we need to be able to done. Instead of a bunch of chat messages going back and forth where we figure all that out, I add a live loop component right here. I'm going to call it a task list. And immediately, everybody on this chat thread can go in and start partying on this list, adding items. It's insanely collaborative. It's insanely real time. And it allows us to really, uh, you know, in this early brainstorming where project, just get on the same page. I'll show you that same demo in Outlook for the web. 
except a different type of loop component. This one really resonates with me. Suppose you're planning a workshop, and you know there's going to be common FAQs. Just imagine the 40 to 50 email stream back and forth as everybody's replying, like, oh, there's this FAQ, and here's the answer, and all this sort of stuff. And sure, you could put it somewhere else, but then you're taking people out of Outlook. No, if you just add a loop component here, there's a particular loop component called Q&A, then right here within Outlook, people can automatically jam and add questions, add answers real time. Everybody can work on the same data. You can copy paste this component into Teams or another email chat, doesn't matter. They're all working on the same data together. That's what we mean by Microsoft Loop is designed for insanely collaborative note taking and brainstorming and that part of the project where you really just need to get that tacit information out of people's heads. Now, that's all available today, but there's one thing that we announced a couple months ago that's not quite available yet, but will be available real soon that you need to know in order to understand Microsoft Loop, which is that we are going to be releasing very soon a web and mobile application, a dedicated experience of working with Loop. So yes, embedding it in Teams and Outlook is, is awesome and probably will be incredibly common, but I'll show you a brief look at what the Loop app is going to look like on the web. So you can see you have workspaces, you have pages, all the loop components are brought together. You can add a little bit of personality to the page. And once again, it's insanely collaborative. It's great for note taking. It's great for the early stage process of bringing a team together and getting information out of people's heads really quickly, all working on the same data in real time. So this is the roadmap for loop. I'll leave it up so people can take a screenshot. It's actually inside a loop in the loop app, so it's a little meta there. And that is basically my time today. If I leave you with three things, I would say on stream, think about a use case for 2023. If you see me in the hallway, go tell me what it is. If you have a cool scenario for list, another great icebreaker if you see me in the hallway is to tell me what that was. And think about how you're going to use Loop on your next project. Thank you all. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, and we thought it would be great to show those three together to show how we're bringing brand new experiences to Microsoft 365, but sharing an underlying strategy of integrating an Outlook and Teams for communications, and all backed by SharePoint storage. I'm really, uh, this isn't an architectural deep dive, but a lot of what you saw, you know, the streaming video capabilities, a lot of work went into SharePoint to power those. Those loop sessions, even the ones in Outlook and Teams, are plumbing of the fluid data structures in the SharePoint storage system, big set of work. Microsoft Lists, of course, backed by SharePoint, including this Nucleus engine that's on the client that lets us have very, very large lists, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands and more rows in a list that you can work with in flaky networks or even offline. And Adam talked about it in lists. And then uh, Kathy showed that we're bringing that approach to the web interfaces for files, including OneDrive. So a lot of great new capabilities. Uh, next up is two big new families uh, that we've introduced in the last couple years. And when we were talking to a lot of companies about what did they need from us next after the base collaboration features in Microsoft 365, we heard two themes. First is engaging your employees more important than ever uh, to retain, attract talent, get them working together grow their skills, super, super important. So we set, took a set of projects we were working on and birthed a new family on top of Microsoft 365 called Viva. And then the second thing people told us is great set of base content collaboration capabilities, but we need more Microsoft in terms of uh, turning that into a more comprehensive set of solutions. And so Chris is going to talk about how we've in the, uh, just a few weeks ago, introduced our roadmap for Microsoft Syntax that includes 16 services uh, built on the content management capabilities in SharePoint, Microsoft AI, and more. Everything from digital signatures to AI-powered content transformation and much more. And so to talk about Viva and Syntax, I'm very excited. Joining us is Chris McNulty. Chris, thanks, Jeff. Good morning. It is great to be back here in Copenhagen and great to be back at ESPC. How many of you have retur are returning to ESPC from a previous conference? Great to see you here. Who's at their first ESPC? That is wonderful. Thank you so much. 
So it has been a big and busy year when we think about everything that we've learned and that we're trying to embed into our solutions for employee experience and for driving content at scale. So let's get back to where we need to be. It does not want to stay. <laughs> I don't need a slide. I can speak to it off the top of my head. So we introduced Microsoft Viva um, about a year and a half ago, looking at all of the shifts in the workforce between everything going remote to people moving to hybrid to return to work and all of those modalities. How can we use the amount of time, the billions of minutes that people already spend inside our digital tools, especially Teams, to provide you with the guidance and experiences that you need to shape the everyday work digital experience of employees and teams to be at their best. So Viva is a very large and rapidly growing area. We originally introduced four modules last year. Since then, we've added more and more and more, and I'd like to just unpack a couple of them for you right here. The first one is Engage. So Engage looks at our investments inside of Yammer and brings them into a community experience that's delivered through Teams as part of Viva. So here I can see a dynamic feed that's filtered by AI to let me know what announcements, what questions are going on around my organization. I can also browse the list of communities to see the pre-established communities or discover a new one. We know over the past three years that we can be great on our own, but we're even better when we're connected with others. So here I can discover a brand new community, be able to participate in those dialogues. And uh, we were talking earlier about Jeff's um, Friday five-minute updates. Um, Storylines are the key place where I can discover people's everyday interactions. So here I can see what one of my colleagues has done, and I can also create my own interaction. Here I can see what my colleague Cameron has posted, and then I can decide to create my own story, which will be shared on my storyline and becomes discoverable to people. And as Adam was mentioning, video is just a powerful way of uh, creating an emotional time machine to have an immediate impact with people, whether they are connected to you in the same time or not. Okay. In addition to communities, we know that um, everyone needs a little bit help of communicating outward and about listening back into the organization. How many of you have ever gone through the experience of creating some form of communication and then deciding, I have to put this into, into Outlook and into Teams? and into Yammer, and I should probably do a SharePoint news post. Have any, any of you ever seen that experience? Yes, yes, yes. So Amplify is really addressing that scenario. So with Viva Amplify, we can construct something we call a campaign, which is a regular structured communication. I can look at prior ones and create a new one, in this case, looking at a benefit enrollment campaign at Relicloud. I decide who's participating in it and what are some of the structures and goals that I'm gonna have inside of the organization. I have a unified authoring canvas where I can use templates to make sure I create the right information that I want to share out using Viva Amplify. And of course, being able to decide which channels it should automatically be shared to, whether those are Outlook, Yammer, SharePoint, or Teams. Inside of those communications, of course, I also have control of the workflow, the approvals, and the publication dates, but when that information goes out. Amplify also helps me understand how that campaign, how that communication is doing relative to my original goals. So I can see where I was intending to distribute that communication inside of here, how I'm interacting with people, and of course, get real-time indicators of how my week-to-week -week messages are doing across the different channels to help make sure that I am tuning my message to show up for people in the way they expect. Now, Viva is not just about putting information out to drive the employee experience, but also about taking it in. So Viva Pulse uses research-tested templates to allow anyone as a team manager to conduct periodic polls or pulses to understand the health of their organization. So here I can look at a list of standardized question types that I might want to get feedback from my team on. How are we doing on a project? How is work-life balance? Um, with each of these, I can see some suggested individual questions that I can ask. Um, are people satisfied with feedback? Do they have enough time to set boundaries around work? And of course, you can construct your own questions. I can decide where I want to send it to. And of course, we protect privacy. You can't see the results on any of these unless you have a sufficient number of responses so it's not obvious who answered what. When someone receives a pulse, they can respond quickly inside of email or Teams or however I distribute it. 
And once those results come back, I can look at them dynamically to understand what I'm seeing and also compare those to common results over time. Now, it's really important to look at that so I understand the health of my team, but I can look at the specific details about where people are asking for more help in a given subject. And again, leveraging AI, reaching out across all of Viva, we're able to show more resources, whether they are learning courses, suggestions in Viva Insights, or more, to help address what we're learning as a result of those pulses. And finally, those results, I can share them with my team or with my leaders if I want to have a broader conversation about what we're finding out. So um, also earlier this year, um, we revamped what we're doing with Viva Connections. Um, Viva Connections has been that gateway experience to driving community throughout the Viva suite. Increasingly, it's important to position Viva Connections as being that home experience for how I get to the rest of the suite. We know as we add more and more and more modules to Viva, it's important to bring them together to solve those challenges that people have in the organization. Here, you can see above the fold, I can see top communications and courses that I need to pay attention to, along with a common launch pad to get into the individual parts of Viva where I want to pay attention. That integration across all of those modules is, is extended to places like the Viva briefing email. Here, I can see not just suggestions about what to do with my time, but also reminders about following up on team meetings, courses that are required for me to take with suggestions to protect my time, and new subjects of interest that are being proposed by Viva topics that I may want to engage with here interactively. And finally, on the Viva front, we've revamped the entire people experience. When people are in a traditional work environment, pre-pandemic, it's easier to look at an org chart and then ask people about what they're doing. The people experience in Viva has been enriched with the signals that we keep in the graph from across the suite. So I cannot just see the traditional organization structure, but I can also um, enrich that with topics of interest from Viva Topics, with common goals that are being expressed as OKRs through the Viva Goals engine and more. So a ton that we've done in Viva and a ton still coming. One of the things that I think is really important about Viva and very different from how Microsoft would have built Viva five or 10 years ago is Viva is very much about our partner ecosystem. Dozens and dozens of partners are working with us to make sure that our customers' investments across this broad ecosystem can be brought together through the Teams platform to make sure that we're bringing that into the flow of work. And so we're continuing to add more and more partners to the Viva ecosystem all the time. And if you're not on this slide and would like to be on it, you should talk to us. Um, as we've seen today, uh, get your cameras out. This is a big and busy roadmap. We have an AMA session with Jeff and most of us later today, so we expect to get lots of questions about these individual elements. Uh, we don't have time to unpack each individual element here on stage, but we're happy throughout the week to take our time on those. And so the last section I want to do is talk about the importance of content. It's been said content is king, and content is the lifeblood of so many organizations. It captures our decisions, our transactions, our creativity, and our engagement. But the world is awash in content. On a typical workday, our customers add over 1.6 billion net new documents to Microsoft 365. That is contributing to over a, uh, the planet being on a path to over 130 billion terabytes of content in the next three years. And across the globe, companies are spending nearly $50 billion trying to manage that content. But we think that we're not getting the proper return on that investment. All too often, information is spread across multiple silos, and the interaction with content remains highly manual. Probably the number one automation tool for content in use in the world today is Outlook. We think we can help with that. So last month, we introduced Microsoft Syntex. Syntex uses the power of the cloud, enriched with AI, to be something that we call content AI. Syntex delivers content AI integrated into the flow of work. And it brings these capabilities together across four value areas. First, how do we enrich content using AI to be able to analyze it, understand it, extract key information, um, add annotations, and generate new content? Secondly, how do we then take that content and bring it into the flow of work, into the applications and processes where people need to work with it to get their jobs done? Third, how do I use 
our AI tooling to manage content throughout its life cycle with capabilities like archiving and backup and security management. And finally, how do I make it possible for our developers to leverage that content for new patterns of, of application creation? Let's take a look at syntax in action. So in this example, I am soliciting bids to build solar power stations in South America. So as you'll see, the first thing here, please come up. Nope. I've learned from Kathy I should just wait. There we go. Um, so in this first example, I can see I've received a number of proposals, um, but they're not in a language I speak. Um, so I can translate into the language I allegedly fluent in, which is English, um, singly or in bulk to dynamically translate inbound content, the proposals that I've received, into English. And I can see that they are referenced in a new folder that's been set up to show English translated content. When I take a look at those, I can still see it's fairly lengthy. And I'm not a hard worker, so I don't want to have to read through every one of these documents. So I can use syntax to dynamically summarize that to generate key points. And in that, I can see, yes, I have a supplier who is ready to fulfill next month to meet my needs. So I'm going to want to get them under contract as quickly as I can. So the next step is how do I generate a standard contract to engage that supplier? This takes advantage of syntax content assembly. Content assembly lets me use ordinary documents to turn into templates, which I can then fill out dynamically, interactively, or by relying on known data sources. So here, I'm picking the supplier that I want to use to generate a new acceptance letter. And when I look at what's been generated, um, I can also realize I want to add my standard terms and conditions. So syntax also provides rich tools to manage PDFs. So I can browse here and see that I want to add additional capabilities. The last step, once I've finished and built this merged agreement that shows all of the terms that I want to have, is making sure that that gets approved. And that is where Syntex e-signature comes in hand. We've worked across our ecosystem with our partners, um, Adobe, and with DocuSign, to make sure that we have a good first party experience there. We love our customers' investments in those technologies, but we also want to address the need that people have to be able to deploy an e-signature solution that lives inside the Microsoft 365 trust boundary. So here, I can select Syntax's e-signature capabilities or one of our partner solutions, and then decide how I want that document to be approved. Um, I'll decide who it's going to go to, who should be the signatories, and then once I've framed that up, the next question is to add the placeholders where people can add their names, their dates, and the other things that I think are important to generate a signed document. At all times, the document stays inside M365, where you can get to it, where you can know it, where you can see it and control it. When I'm ready to send that document out, uh, the right people will get links to be able to interact with that document. So here I can see from the perspective of an external person, um, that they've received a new e-signature request, and they can bring it up, and they can uh, supply a cryptographic signature or a wet signature, whatever they choose, um, being able to add that. At all points in the process, the originator gets to keep track of what's going on and to see where we are in the approval process. And once that contract is finally signed, I'm going to be notified that it's been there and approved by all parties, and we're going to be able to build those solar power stations here and be able to reference these um, completed documents at the end. So the last thing I wanted to talk about are some existing integrations that we just shipped about a month or two ago, bringing the power of Power Platform to what we are doing with Syntex. So in this example, I'm running a real estate company, and I'm receiving inbound lease agreements, and I need to use those to generate confirmation letters to property managers. So let's take a look at that process. So here, the first thing I'm going to do is to create a model. Syntex brings together powerful AI modeling technologies from across Microsoft, from Power Platform, from Azure, and from Syntex's own AI. So the first step in building a model is to select the kind of model I'm going to create. And in this case, I'm going to build a model by specifying which fields I want to pull in and uploading as few as five sample documents to build the AI. I mark up inside of the documents where I want to pull data when I see it. And magically, we're going to go through quickly in the video to pull out all the rest of the fields. And that's the first step. The second step, 
generating a template to send out to the property managers. We took a quick look at the document template engine before. So here I can see a different template I've uploaded, and I mark up placeholders in the document where I want people to either be able to supply live data that's typed in, or selected from a data source, or driven by a workflow inside Power Automate. Now once that template is structured, the final step here is looking at it inside of Power Automate because we support the triggers and actions that you need inside Power Automate to leverage these capabilities that Syntex is adding to the vocabulary of business process here. Okay, finally, um, we receive new rental agreements, we upload them, Syntex spins through them all, extracts the right metadata, voila, and as the model finishes, it also triggers content assembly, so we can see the outbound confirmation letter is already being generated to match the inbound lease agreements. So we can automate a business process start to finish in just a few minutes and be able to turn our attention to more important work. So again, as you've seen before, um, get your photos out. Syntax has a large and busy roadmap, and I encourage you to come to the AMA to ask us questions in more detail about each of these items. We are really excited. We love coming to conferences, especially ESPC. So please, if you see me, if you have ideas or questions, please engage me or the rest of the team. We'd love to hear from you and take all that feedback in. Um, there's resources that are already available to get started uh, with Syntex. We'd encourage you to take a look at those. And that said, uh, let me bring Jeff back up here to wrap us up. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. You know, I, I knew most of that, or all of it, but even I'm a little bit exhausted. Uh, so it's okay. You know, I know it's like first thing in the morning, and maybe we've turned the fire hose on a little bit. Uh, but the good news is there's a lot of detailed sessions on everything you just saw. I think the main thing I want you to take away is that we are focused on the full spectrum. Everything from simplicity and performance for people just trying to chat with other, each other, join a meeting, collaborate on documents, who may never immerse themselves in this level of detail. But these are very real mission critical needs of engaging your employee base, transforming business processes, the things we've added in terms of model building, digital signatures from the roadmap, et cetera, are essential. You've told us they're essential to those solutions. And so hopefully you see us investing in that full spectrum, everything from fundamentals for core scenarios to new innovations. You know, we, um, uh, in the interest of fitting everything into a 60-minute session, of which we've got a couple minutes left, we mainly focused the keynote on end-user experiences because we know we've got some drill-down sessions coming up. But I, I just wanted to highlight a couple things and maybe put a plug for uh, two key sessions that are both on Thursday. It's very easy to remember their names because the two presenters' names rhyme, Seisha and Vesa. Uh, so on the IT Pro side, we didn't really get to show much of it here, but a huge comprehensive set of new security, compliance, risk insights, and much more built into Microsoft 365 and integrating on top as well as with other systems beyond Microsoft 365 in Microsoft Purview to give you a very comprehensive set of services for data governance and risk and compliance. Uh, Seisha Mani from our team is going to cover that in a lot more detail on Thursday, sort of essential session for this space in data governance. Next up is our, of course, we love developers, developers, developers. I started my career, uh, I won't share how long ago, long time ago in developer evangelism at Microsoft. And one of the things I'm most proud of is how we've evolved SharePoint and Teams and the rest of Microsoft 365 is a development platform. At Build this year, our developer conference, Charles Lamana, who runs our Power Platform team, and I shared our comprehensive vision across Microsoft for building collaborative apps, taking the core flow of work capabilities of Teams and SharePoint and more, and integrating it with business systems and transforming business processes with the Power Platform. We laid out a whole framework for that, and uh, feel free to go back and watch that. I just wanted to highlight a couple things. First is 
Uh, we've had a very consistent message in our development platform for the last six, seven plus years and really haven't changed it fundamentally. First is the data is available via REST APIs via the Microsoft Graph. That could be people or documents, email messages, chats. We're expanding the surface area so you can integrate the underlying data in Microsoft 365 in your applications. Second is we announced um, as part of our new SharePoint initiative a few years ago, the underlying way we rendered pages would be called the SharePoint framework. And it's how we let people build these components that the end users could put on pages and mix and match and have a lot of flexibility. Well, over the last couple of years, we've brought this to more surfaces. We brought it to Microsoft Teams, we brought it to Viva, and we most recently announced where we're bringing the SharePoint framework to even Outlook in the Microsoft 365 app. So again, SharePoint framework for user experience customization, Microsoft Graph for data integration. Besa, in his session, is going to talk about that in a lot more detail. Uh, on Thursday, Besa is sort of a mainstay of ESPC. I heard he's going to jump over a chair or something like that. Uh, it's a throwdown challenge, Besa. Uh, unlike the rest of us, he came from Finland, so he shouldn't be jet lagged like me. He should be fresh, and chair jumping should be essential part of ESPC again after three years. Um, but there's more. A key part of democratizing solution development in the world in any backend application, but in particular Microsoft 365, is the Power Platform. And I am so thrilled that the team that's put together ESPC is also partnering with the Power Platform team. Heather Newman's here from them. If you uh, don't know Heather, uh, she'll wave and meet you during the course of the week. Uh, they, the team just had an event in Orlando with a ton of sessions. I was there with Charles. A big event coming up in Dublin in June from the ESPC team uh, for the European Power Platform Conference. It will be really complementary to the things we're covering around Microsoft 365 this week. So very excited uh, to see their support. And so with that, uh, again, I know it's a lot. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sitting through the session this week. Uh, there's tons more content, and the um, team is so thrilled. Say hi to us in the hallways and in the sessions, and thank you again for being part of the best community in technology.